Amen. Amen. Well, we're introducing this afternoon a, a new series of messages entitled More Than Seven Sons. And you will recall that this is what was spoken concerning Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi from Moab. It was said, she is more to you than seven sons. And the whole book of Ruth is actually a wonderful story of the providence of God in the problems of life. So I wonder this afternoon if there's anyone here who has any problems. Wonder if there's anyone here this afternoon who perhaps has some health issues that you're struggling with. Uh, Wonder if there's anyone here this afternoon that is experiencing grief because of the death of a loved one. I wonder if there's uh, anyone here struggling to make ends meet, anyone with problems financially. I wonder if there's anyone here just feeling troubled by the general state of affairs in the world around you. It just seems that there are problems on every hand. And there are wars and there are Rumors of wars, and there's poverty, and there's famine, and there are people who profess one thing, but actually practice something altogether different. Any of that ever concern any of us? No doubt it does. We know about problems. But what we sometimes miss is the evidence of the providence of God at work in the problems of life. Now, you might have felt slightly more comfortable if I had said the providence of God at work in spite of the problems of life. Because that would mean that, well, the problems are not necessarily... They're by design. They're not exactly intended, but uh, they're there, and the Lord just makes the best possible use of them. When in reality, the Scripture teaches us the meticulous providence of God. I know the old adage is that the devil is in the detail, but the reality is we believe in a God who is in the detail. And who is working in all the details of life to accomplish all of his good plans and purposes for us. And so if you have any problems, you're in the right place. And if you're struggling at times to make sense of those problems and to see how God is at work in them and through them, this series is for you. And I trust that you'll not only listen very carefully and attentively, but I trust you'll make uh, use of the recordings to listen again and perhaps even to pass along to others uh, who you believe might find them helpful. Now, the particular person that we're going to focus on throughout this book is not Ruth. In fact, you do recognize that the name Ruth is not necessarily to be considered as a part of the text. That's just the name that's been given to it. And more than one conservative scholar down through the centuries has suggested that actually the book should be entitled Naomi because it has much more to say about her than it does about Ruth. And especially when you look at it in terms of problems, 
These are the problems of one woman in particular. But how God worked in her problems to work out his providence, including bringing into her family someone who would be an ancestress of none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Naomi had problems. Can you help me think of a few of them just to begin with? What's the first problem that Naomi had as we encounter her in the first five verses? No, 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 no. Even before then, there was a famine. So long before she lost her husband, she, um, she lost her food. There was a famine in the land. And so she's hungry. And this was a very real problem. All right, now I heard another problem mentioned. What was that? Bereavement. Uh, bereavement. Bereavement, first of all, I think Ron, perhaps, and David mentioned, she lost her husband. She had this man, her husband, named Elimelech. God is my king. And she followed her husband, Elimelech, from Bethlehem, Judah, to Moab. And whilst they were there in Moab, her husband died. Now we have in our church a number of people who have had a similar experience. Our dear brother Albert, not that long ago, experienced Bereavement when his dear wife, Pam, passed away. And he'll be the first to tell you it's a problem. And it's not a problem that you realize all at once. But it's a problem that just sort of settles in on you over a long period of time. And Albert's not the only one. Others have lost a husband or a wife, that's a problem. Now, what's a, another problem? We might say, what was the next problem that Naomi experienced? Now, uh, Cliff is, is sort of plucking up the courage to, to answer. Go ahead. What, what did you have in mind, brother? A son's married to foreign wives. All right. Her son's married foreign wives. So, now I have a son who's uh, married to um, uh, an Israeli. And I have a, another son uh, who's married to a Ukrainian. And I, I, I have a third son who's married to someone who's English. All three of my sons married foreign wives, at least to them. So what's the difference? Is it that, you know, Malon and Kilion married uh, good God-fearing, you know, Moabite women, uh, but they just happened to have a different ethnicity or a different nationality? Is, that's not the issue? What, what was the real issue? It wasn't permitted to take wives from other nations. All right. And what was the particular reason that it was not permitted? The introduction of foreign gods. So it would be better for me to have uh, a son who's married to someone from Israel who knows and loves and follows and serves the Lord Jesus Christ than to be married to a nice American girl who doesn't know and love the Savior at all. Yeah. Her problems are just starting though. What's her next problem? What happens to these two sons? They both died. 
And I, I, I hope you won't think that I'm being disrespectful or unkind or unsympathetic in any way. But now, in a sense, she's stuck with these two daughters-in-law that she wouldn't have chosen. Her sons have married unbelievers, and now her sons have died, and she has these two daughters-in-law. Now, she had always hoped to go back to Bethlehem, Judah. They were always very clear in their intentions That nice word, sojourn, they've come there to stay temporarily. But now she's got a real problem because she's going to go back to Bethlehem with two Moabite women in tow. And she's going to be able to explain to people why her sons had married people that you know, she had disapproved of. And what could she do? Elimelech had died and, you know, he was no longer there to give leadership to uh, the family. And, and you suppose that might have been the topic of a little bit of conversation around Bethlehem, Judah? Uh, they knew about these prohibitions and they, they knew about the uh, prescriptive uh, laws concerning uh, intermarriage with Non-believers from other nationalities. Naomi's got quite a few problems. And as we work our way through this book, we're going to see her problems continue to mount. Her problems continue to increase and intensify. And we are going to be left at times with the conclusion that, that Naomi has, has just gotten herself into a real pickle and there's really no way out. But something quite mysterious is going on. It's not just mysterious, it's miraculous. God is working his plans and purposes out in these problems. Now I ask you again, do you have problems? Well, maybe nothing to compare to Naomi's now after we've just rehearsed a few of hers. But do you have faith to believe that God in his providence is working in your problems for his glory and for your good? Now, uh, the book of Ruth is what is called historical narrative. That means that it is a factual account of actual events occurring at a specific period of time in a specific place and involving specific people. And it is recorded for us for a special purpose and that special purpose is spiritual in nature. But here's the catch. The purpose is never explicitly stated. You just have to discern what that purpose is through a careful analysis of the specific periods of time, the specific places, and the specific people involved. But I want to let you know from the very beginning... I believe the special purpose for which this book was originally inspired and has been preserved for us and included in our scriptures is that we might see the meticulous providence of God in the maddening problems of life. Now, We don't have a lot of time. So we can't focus on everything 
even in the space of these five verses. It, it would be interesting for us to think about the specific places. Bethlehem in Judah and Moab. It would be interesting for us to think about the specific people. This man named Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons, Malon and Chilion, and later their two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. It would be interesting to think about both those specific places as well as those specific people. And this is, after all, one of the other external proofs and internal authenticating marks of the inerrancy of Scripture. This story does not begin in a land far, far away, in a time long, long ago. There was a man whose name no one remembers and he was married to a woman that no one took much notice of. No, the specific periods of time are all identified. You can look at it in the context of history. The specific places are all identified. You can look at it in the context of geography. The specific people are mentioned. You, you can uh, look at it in terms of uh, the genealogical records that were and are in existence. This is a factual account of actual events. This actually happened. And Naomi had every one of the problems that we're going to discuss in the coming weeks. And we see God work in each of them for His glory. But since we don't have adequate time this afternoon to look at the, the specific places or the specific people, I thought it might be a good idea if maybe we focused our attention just on the specific periods of time. Any of you interested in history in general, in uh, chronological history in uh, particular? Uh, I am. And well, I think David is. And if the rest of you will just bear with us for the next few minutes, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be well satisfied uh, as our historical curiosity uh, is uh, addressed, at least in some measure. Now, there are various references to time in this passage. Did you notice them? Of course you did. It begins with a reference to a specific period of time. In the days when the judges ruled. That's a reference to time, isn't it? And where does Ruth appear in the canon of Scripture? It appears right after the book of Judges. After the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, you have Joshua, Judges, and then what happens next? Ruth. And so what we are seeing here is if you look just at the last verse of Judges, it's just there on the page, or maybe in your Bible, maybe just the page before. Someone just read out, please, verse 25 of Judges 21. Do you have it there, Steve? In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In the days when the judges ruled... Ah, so you see what's happening here. This is a reference to that period of time when there was no king in Israel and when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So I'm going to call this a period of lawlessness. Because in those days, there was no king in Israel, no governing authority, and everyone did what? What was right in their own eyes. And this book of Ruth is written in the days when the judges ruled. 
Now, what I want to show you is this. It was not just a case of people in general doing what was right in their own eyes. It was a case of even, <clears throat> can we use the expression, people who ought to know better doing what was right in their own eyes. Because now we are introduced to this man named Elimelech. And his name means God is king. He should know better. And he is married to Naomi, and her name means pleasant, sweet. They have two sons, Malon, Chilion. What a lovely family. Certainly they will recognize that God is their king and that his word is the governing authority for their life. But what happened when famine came to Bethlehem, Judah? They did what was right in their own eyes. And they left Bethlehem, Judah, went into Transjordania to that particular place called Moab to a people that they had been explicitly commanded not to have dealings with. Now, I know, I know, some people will say, well, you know, you get hungry, you do strange things. Famine comes, you know, you've got, you can't just sit there and die. You've got to, you know, you've got to do something. And, and we're actually showing that in our own hearts, we have a little bit of sympathy for this idea of people just doing what is right in their own eyes. Elimelech and Naomi and their sons though they make a profession, are in reality just as lawless in their hearts. You say, well, those are... <clears throat> that's not very kind. Uh, what's led you to arrive at that conclusion? Well, what happens as soon as Elimelech dies? His sons take foreign wives. And the sin here was that they took wives who were worshipers of other gods. They married outside the faith. They did what was right in their own eyes. And no doubt... It would not have been what Elimelech had chosen. No doubt it would not be what Naomi liked, but that's what happened. They did what was right in their own eyes. They were a law to themselves. And so if they are in famine conditions in Bethlehem, Judah, they'll flee to Moab. And if they don't have wives and don't have uh, Israelite wives to choose from or wives from Judah to choose from, they will marry those who are available. And it's just lawlessness. But I've overstated my case. Was this really a period of lawlessness? There was a king. Whether they acknowledged him or not, their king was the thrice holy God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was their king. And they were under his governing authority. And his governing authority even makes, I, I tread carefully here, providential use of sinful choices and behavior. Was it wrong for them to go to Moab? Yes. Was it wrong for Malon and Chilion to marry uh, Moabite women? Yes. But did God use that for His purposes 
for His glory and for the ultimate good of His people. Absolutely. God is not just adjusting on the fly. God is not just accommodating Himself to what human beings choose. God has plans and purposes which are as immutable as His own character. He knows the end from the beginning and He performs all His pleasures and so you can have confidence this afternoon that your problem, excuse me, your problems, regardless of how significant they are, regardless of how serious they are, God is at work in those problems, your problems, for His glory and for your good. This in no way is to make God the author of or the approver of sin. Uh, This in no way releases us from moral culpability for doing things which are contrary to the revealed will of God. Make no mistake about this. But we must recognize that there is law even when there is seeming lawlessness, and that there is a king in the land even when there appears to be no king. And that should encourage us. That should help us in our times of problems. Now, uh, could I suggest to you a, a second period of time? Uh, There is an an additional reference uh, to time in uh, just those few uh, verses we read a moment ago. Look at the end of verse 4. What does the last sentence of verse 4 say? Just anyone. Do you have it there, Sarah? They dwelt there about 10 years. They dwelt there about 10 years. So you recognize everything that takes place in the first five verses here actually took place over a decade. It it took place over 10 years of time. So look back to 2012, the Olympics in London. From that point until now, that's the period of time we're talking about. Look forward into the future, 2032. How old will you be? Uh, Don't answer that question. Some of you, the calculator says E when you get that far. No, no. Ten years, that's a long period of time. And this ten-year period of time is a sustained, prolonged period of loss. One loss after the other, after the other, after the other. Have you ever had a period like that? They go from Bethlehem, Judah to Moab. She was following her husband. She was doing what she believed was right. Elimelech wouldn't lead them astray. They weren't going to be there always. I mean, it's, it's written there. This is just a, a sabbatical in Moab. This is just a sojourn in this, you know, in this foreign land. They, they don't actually intend to stay. But they do. And the length of their stay is increased because now a Elimelech up and dies. And here she is having followed her husband into this situation, her husband is dead and now she is here. And she has these two sons who are reaching majority status and it doesn't take a lot of imagination, doesn't take a lot of you know filling in the blanks or reading between the lines. Uh, in any of you ever had young men who were approaching maturity, approaching uh, young adulthood? Uh, Francis, you're not allowed to contribute at this point. Um, you know... Um, Yes, of course. And we know that sometimes that's difficult under the best of circumstances. But what if there's no man in the house? What if there's no husband, you know, in the house? What if there's no father? And these two sons are now doing what? 
what's right in their own eyes. They're not going to be told who they can go out with. They're not going to be told what time they have to come in. They're not going to be told who they can live with or who they can marry. They're going to do what's right in their own eyes. And she not only lost her husband, but now she loses her sons even while they are still living. Some of you will know the reality. If not the physical death of a child, you will know what it is like for a child to not walk in the ways in which they were taught to walk, to not live in the ways in which they were shown to live, to not keep up the, the, the pattern of worshiping God and being in fellowship with His people. They, they reach a certain age and their heart hasn't been here for a long time and now their body follows their heart. They're elsewhere. It's a problem. But what does a mother do? You know what a mother does. A mother always clings to hope. A mother always hopes and, and she prays. And, you know, may, may, maybe she gave, you know, uh, Melon and uh, Chilion invitations to, you know, uh, you know, come to something she was having at the house. Or, you know, may, may, maybe she sought the opportunity to, you know, have a quiet word with them from time to time. Maybe to remind them of something that their father had said or something that they had learned, you know, back when they were in Bethlehem, Judah. And, you know, she tried to make best use of all the opportunities, but they were switched off. But a mother always holds out hope, doesn't she? But then they die. And her hope perished with them. It's a period of loss. Have you had a decade like that? The queen had a horrible year, Naomi had a horrible decade, one problem after another problem. And if you think the Bible whitewashes things and just presents everything as very neat and clean and sanitary, it it doesn't. It's very real and very genuine about the lives of real people with real problems who are in need of a real Savior. That's what's happening here. Well, um, there, there's, there's only one other specific reference to a period of time uh, in the entire first chapter, and you actually have to go all the way to the end of the chapter to see that. We didn't read it a moment ago. But the last sentence, not the last verse, it's in the last verse, but the last sentence of chapter 1 begins with and someone just have it there read it out please and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest now it's going to come to us in a couple of weeks why that's so significant as we begin to move particularly into chapter 2 but I'm going to submit to you that if in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, introduces to us uh, a period of lawlessness. And if the, the words, and they dwelt there for about 10 years, introduces to us a period of loss. I'm going to suggest to you that the uh, sentence, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest, introduces to us a period of learning. A period of learning. Naomi had a lot to learn. She was focused in the first instance on her problems and how to extricate herself from her problems. I'm hungry. Well, we'll leave this country and we'll go where there's food to be found. I don't have a husband. I'll pour myself into my children. My children marry unbelievers, those 
to whom they ought not to be married. Well, well, they're my, they're my children, and I, I'm, I'm going to maintain the same relationship with them. They, they die, and she keeps trying to extricate herself from her problems rather than recognizing that God is at work in her problems in ways that she could not ever imagine. A period of learning. Let me show you one thing. Question. Why did Naomi leave Bethlehem Judah? Ten years ago now, she leaves Bethlehem Judah. Why was it, Albert? Why, why did she leave to start with? Why did she go to Moab? No, no comprende, okay? He, he, he can't hear Okay, John, can you, he'll phone a friend. Uh, uh, why, why did she leave Bethlehem Judah to start with? Why did she go to Moab? There was famine in the land. No food. Okay, there was a famine in the land. There was no food. She left because she was empty and she wanted to go to Moab. Why? Because there would be food there and she could eat there and she would be filled. So she's empty and she goes out in order to be filled. So... Look at verse 19. So the two of them, now we'll discover uh, next week that the two of them is now um, Naomi plus one, Ruth. They went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. You can imagine that. And the women said, is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Mara, sweet or pleasant. Uh, Do not call me Naomi. Thank you, Sarah. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Really? 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 She's got a lot to learn, doesn't she? Because now she's looking at her problems and her assessment is, I used to be pleasant. I used to be sweet. But don't call me that anymore. Call me Mara. Look at me. I am embittered and I am embittered because God has given me a raw deal. The Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. So no more of that Naomi business from now on. Call me Mara. And listen to what she said. I went away full. And the Lord has brought me back empty. What sort of histrionics are those? What sort of revisionism is that? But we do it all the time, don't we? We get ourselves into a situation as a result of our own sinful choices, as a result of our own sinful behavior, and suddenly nothing to do with us. It's God. I went out. I think she's beginning to see the light because she's come to realize that there are some things that are more important than trying to preserve yourself from famine. After all, what about these people who recognized her 10 years after the fact? How did they survive? How were they fed? How were they provided for? She took matters along with her husband into their own hands and then blamed God for the consequences, blamed God for the outcome. I went away full and I've come back empty. When in reality, she would have justified her decision to leave Bethlehem Judah in the first instance by saying, I went out empty and in due course, I'm going to come back full. But it didn't work out to plan. 
It didn't work out like they had envisioned. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? She has a lot to learn. And the writer of these words simply says, gives us a little hint. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. And she's about to enter reception level in the Bethlehem Judah School of Divine Providence. And she's about to begin to learn how all of these problems that she's been experiencing over the past decade were not of God's making, they were of her own making, but she's then going to learn an even more profoundly significant truth that God was working in even her sinful choices and behaviors to accomplish His immutable will and purpose. So if you just fast forward in your thinking as we draw to a close this afternoon, wonderful, wonderful. This is, as many a writer has called it, the gospel according to Ruth. And you see her here with this babe in arms. This babe who will be the grandfather, right, of King David. And they say to her, this Ruth is better to you than seven sons. It's not that God has a plan B. He just kind of do the best you can with what you got. You know, they, they used to ask people, how do you know if you're married to the right woman? And of course, the answer to that question is, look at your marriage license and whoever's name is there is the right woman. So how do you know if you're experiencing plan A for your life? Look at your life. All of it. And that's not God's second best. That's plan A. All of it. Your sins, your faults, your failings, your shortcomings, your backslidings, all of it. God is making use of all of it for His glory and for your ultimate good. And so by the end of this book, (laughs) things will have changed with Naomi. It says, this child placed in her arms will be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons and she has given birth to him. And then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, A son has been born to... Who? No! A son has been born to Naomi. And they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse the father of David, and you keep following those generations right down, right down, right down. And Matthew chapter 1, 
Where does this line lead? It leads to our Lord Jesus Christ. No Moab. No Messiah. For it was through means of that sinful sojourn in Moab that God's sinless Messiah came to his people. It's not the death of Elimelech or of Malon or Chilion that brings salvation, but the death of that great, 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 give it up, one more, great grandson of Ruth, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to pay the price for the sins of Elimelech. Naomi, Boaz, Ruth, Frank, and Joy, and Sarah, and Barry. As our pastor Steve says, hallelujah, what a savior. Wonderful, the providence of God in the problems of life. We'll read the rest of the book this week and we'll uh, pick up with verse 6 next week and we'll take the next section and think about Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and all that we can learn from that. Well, we'll stand this week.